All right, everybody knows that Milwaukee is a beer town, but it's also the home of at least one award-winning distillery. Uh, we were the first distillery to open in the state of Wisconsin since Prohibition. That's Doug McKenzie of Great Lakes Distillery. He cooks up about 3,500 bottles of spirit a year, and he agreed to show us how he uses this to make this. But let's start with a little history. The Poles and the Russians both claim to be the first to make vodka, and the Poles always made it from potatoes, and the Russians always made it from grain. So historically, people think that potatoes is what vodka comes from. But the truth is today, most vodkas aren't made from potatoes. Whatever you're using, whether it's fruit or grain, or potatoes or sugar cane, um, you're looking to get a fermentable sugar. You just need something that yeast can convert into carbon dioxide and ethyl alcohol. Fermentation is also how you make beer or wine, and this isn't a coincidence. All spirits typically start out as, as beer or wine, essentially. Um, we essentially brew a, a hopless wheat beer using malted wheat, straight wheat, water and yeast. We wanted to learn a little more about what was happening chemically during okay. fermentation. So we actually headed to the science wing of NYU. Kent Kirschenbaum, a chemist there, kindly offered to conduct a distilling demo for us in his fume hood. He and his grad student Ricky Silver started by fermenting cherry juice with this yeast to make a cherry wine. See there's an airlock on top? That's to keep oxygen out. That's called an anaerobic condition. And so many yeasts will respond differently in those particular cases, and they'll really produce a lot of ethanol under anaerobic conditions. So the yeast will happily crank out ethanol up until the point where they become intoxicated and they can't live anymore. So this means there's a limit on the percent of alcohol you can get in beer and wine, and that's dependent on what the strain of yeast can tolerate. And then if we want to get a material that is um, enriched in alcohol, at that point we have to switch over to a distillation process, and that's what we're going to do right now. Let's go back to Milwaukee. The, the liquid starts out in the kettle here. The heat is applied with the steam jacket. The vapors rise, they hit that plate, a lot of them will condense and start to fall back as liquid. The still separates the water from the alcohol using phase separation. You can see how it works in Kirschenbaum's mini still. So alcohol boils at a lower temperature than water. It moves up the still as vapor while the water sits behind in the kettle. The ridges here that catch the vapor are like the plates in the big still. And there we go, the first drop is coming out. What's coming out of the stills is the stuff that boils first. So I asked Kirschenbaum. Is there a way to simply explain why chemicals have different boiling points? No, I mean, this is like I'm an instructor in chemistry. This is exactly what I should be able to do. So why do different molecules boil at different temperatures? In some cases, molecules have very strong interactions with one another. They're able to stick to each other really tightly. And water molecules are able to do that to a really remarkable degree because of sticking interactions called hydrogen bonds. Other molecules don't stick so well, so it takes less energy to get them to boil. The other factor is molecular weight. Lighter molecules boil faster than heavier ones, which comes in handy when you're trying to separate out different alcohols. In that beer, there's acetone, methanol, uh, propyl alcohols. They all boil at slightly different temperatures. So what will first flow out of the still here will be mostly acetone and methanol. And that's because those are lower molecular weight molecules? That's right. For vodka, McKenzie only wants the ethanol. And you can smell why. Is that a familiar smell? Yes. Nail polish remover? Yeah. Because <laughs> this is mostly acetone that's in here. So, you know, whenever you buy a, if you buy a can of acetone at your local hardware store or you buy a bottle of fingernail polish remover, it's all a byproduct of, of an ethanol plant. This is where those higher boiling point alcohols end up. But depending on what spirit you're making, you actually might want to keep some of them in. If you just put pure ethanol in an oak barrel for a number of years, yeah, it'll look like whiskey and it'll have brown color to it, but it'll pretty much taste like oaky vodka. <laughs> Finally, the gin. It's one of Great Lakes signatures. In fact, it was awarded a double gold medal at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition this year. For comparison, Tangeray won last year. 
Essentially, gin is flavored vodka. And according to the law, the predominant flavor in gin must be juniper berries, but Great Lakes adds a few other ingredients as well. Coriander seeds, cardamom, cassia, a bit of anise seed, dehydrated orange and lemon peel. And then the two ingredients that are unique to ours that you won't find in any other are sweet basil and then uh, ginseng root from Wisconsin. It makes all the other flavors combine and kind of pop out a little bit more. And each one of these flavors is made of many different molecules, right? That's right. Um, there's no such thing as uh, one molecular component that is just the cherry molecule. Um, any cherry juice, any fruit juice, the flavor that develops is the combination of different molecules as they interact with your taste buds and probably also interact with your olfactory system as well. And these flavor molecules, just like the alcohols, have different boiling points. It's, it's amazing how the different flavors really do come through at different times. The basil, which is um, really starts to come through at, at the end here, in fact, it, it starts to taste like a green vegetable, really. So Mackenzie's job is to only bottle the stuff that comes out of the still that has the flavors he wants. That's why he keeps tasting it. But, you know, we use complete taste and smell for that. So there's no, there's no scientific instrument that's as precise as, as the human nose and tongue, so. I wondered what Kirschenbaum thought about that. Could you get to where you wanted to be doing a chemical analysis? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and like a lot of science, it depends what your objectives are. If your objectives are to make something that would be pleasurable for human consumption, probably there's no better way to evaluate what's going on in the process than using the human tongue and nose. That's ready to go. The good stuff is mixed with water. This batch will make about 500 bottles, and then it's ready to drink. I'm Flora Lichtman for Science Friday.